Can you say hello once so that we can check our audio? Yes. Hello, this is Simon Johnson in Washington, D.C. Any break, you can sit on them off, turn them off, and they can cool down. So, can you hear us? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was Perfect, perfect. Uh, Professor Johnson, we apologize for this technical glitch. Yes. Hello, this is Simon Johnson. Thank you so much. Our uh, people sitting in this hall can hear you very loud and clear. I would like to thank all the attendees also for joining us and we sincerely apologize for this delay. So this is the conference keynote address by Professor Sa uh, Simon Johnson. He is Ronald A. Kurtz, Professor of Entrepreneurship and Head Global Economics and Management Group, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Sloan School of Management, USA, and former chief economist of the IMF. We are very thankful for him uh, to him for agreeing to deliver this keynote address. I invite Professor Ravi Shivastav, the conference coordinator, to please introduce Professor Johnson, Professor Valodia, and the lecture. Professor Johnson, in a lighter vein, this was an unanticipated technology-related disruption. Uh, but uh, we are very pleased that we have you for this keynote address. Um, although, of course, we would have been so happy had you been here with us today. Uh, my job is to welcome you on behalf of IHD. The audience has been looking forward to your lecture, to hear, looking uh, to to hearing it, and also seeing you. I hope the we get the, the machine, the, uh, the projector working in a little while. But nonetheless, I, my job here is to simply to introduce the chair, Professor Imran Valodia, and to you, to the audience. They already have a detailed bio, biographical note on you and Professor Imran. I will be very brief so in order to cut back on the time that has already been lost. Professor Imran Valodia, uh, has, you've been, everybody here has been seeing him since the morning. He is a very co close friend of IHD. He's the director of the International Center for Equality Studies, Inequality Studies in Wits University, and currently also the Pro Vice Chancellor of the university. Uh, it is, it is, he has kindly agreed to chair this lecture. Professor Johnson, friends, has already been introduced to you as the Ronald Kutz Professor of Entrepreneurship at MIT. Uh, he's an economist of great international repute associated with a large number of policy teams uh, in the government in the US. Uh, he has written a number of books which have been uh, bestsellers. His, uh, uh, his last book, I mean, the, 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 the third book that he, the, that he wrote was already, it was called Jumpstarting America, How Breakthrough Science Can Revive Economic Growth and the American Dream. And uh, this already sets the tone for probably what he would speak today, but his uh, the most recent book that he has written, uh, which is with, with Darren S. Moglu, which is Power and Progress, Our Thousand Year Struggle Over Technology and Prosperity, explores some of the central themes which we are looking at in this conference. It looks at the history and economics of major technological choices up to and including the latest developments in artificial intelligence. So with these words, I hand you over now to the chair of the session, Professor Imran Valodia. Great, thank you so much, Ravi. Um, I'm also going to keep it quite short. So I think the 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 way that we've we've dealt with the technology issue all of today is really to work on the assumption that the that the technology that we're seeing. Aha. Uh -huh. Links. Links. That the, the 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 kind of technology that we've been debating is something that we take as uh, as as uh, 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 kind of assumed and something that we don't have a lot of um, a lot of control on. Um, I think the really interesting thing about about the talk today uh, by Professor Simon Johnson is that in his book with, with uh, 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 Darren Asamoglu, what 
Simon does is to question uh, uh, whether we need to accept this technology as is, or whether we have agency to actually shape it and to change it um, kind of in ways that would be employment enhancing. So with that, let me uh, 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 pass it on to Professor Simon Johnson to deliver the lecture. Uh, Simon, just to update you, we, we, we hope that we can now hear and see you um, in, in this room um, and everyone online, um, I'm sure can, can hear and see you. So let me pass it to you then, Simon. Thank you very much, uh, Imran. Thanks for the opportunity, uh, everyone, to speak with you today. It's a great honor and privilege. So I, I plan to speak for perhaps 30 minutes, and then I hope we have plenty of time for question and answer, because I have some potential <laughs> um, points that are relevant to what Imran just said in terms of the framing. Uh, can we redirect technological change? Um, when, how, and to achieve what exactly? But I also have a lot of questions, and I have a, a lot of um, I think um, hopefully some provocation for, for your audience, some engagement, Imran, around these issues, particularly future of the work in the global south, I think is, there's, there's, a, there's a lot at stake here. So I, I would say, uh, broadly speaking, that I have some good news for you today, at least our assessment of, of the history and the reality and the economics of technological change has a, a lot of encouraging positive elements. Uh, but there is also uh, a, a very big note of caution, which I will come on to. So let's say there's some good news and some, well, less good news, ambiguous news. You might even say it's bad, bad news, but we will we will discuss that. So um, let me let me make five points a and um, let me try to speak quite deliberately with a little bit of repetition, because I know that. Um, I sometimes speak too quickly in in these situations, and when I'm writing, when I'm talking about topics that are um, pretty engaging, the the, the first uh, point is when we're talking about technological change and we're talk talking about the modern world. When exactly did this begin? Right. So we were grappling with technology <laughs> over the past half hour. It's a wonderful metaphor for both what technology can deliver, but also the complexities, the, the difficulties, the unintended uh, consequences. And obviously, one um, time frame for this discussion, and one that I will use and come back to, is the Industrial Revolution. So everything about our world um, is shaped in, in some senses by the development of industrial factories cities full of workers, the cotton industry, which was a very particular relationship between Lancashire um, and factories and water power in the north of England, where I'm from, and of course, uh, India and um, the colonial relationship, the exploitative relationship, the deindustrialization of India, I think, um, is, is part of this story. But the Industrial Revolution is, is one framing that's 250 years or so of, of change, but I actually prefer to start the story of modern technology in, in a mu much more specific moment. I, I actually, the term industrial revolution is really a misnomer. It was not a revolution like the French Revolution or other uh, tumultuous sudden changes of power or social structure. It was a long drawn out uh, process, as I think most of you are aware, but there was a revolution in thinking that's highly relevant to what we're gonna talk about today. And that happened in spring of 1940 in the United States, during and immediately after Germany defeated, well, pretty much everyone uh, they wanted to defeat in Western Europe, including France and Britain. Because th this was a very big shock to um, not just the sort of national security side of, of, of US thinking, but also thinking about economics and, and economics of technology and, and, and scientific change. The, the Germans had, it became very clear in a period of two weeks, developed technology and applied technology and combined technologies in a way that their opponents were not prepared to counter, with, with a particular emphasis on aircraft and how the, the Germans had 
developed aircraft and how they were using aircraft. And the Americans looking at this made a decision. And, and the key person here is a gentleman by the name of Veniva Bush, who was a former Dean of Engineering at MIT. At that time, he was in Washington, DC. He went to see Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the then American president and said, you know, we need to get serious about upgrading our military, upgrading the technology, and we need to apply all of the scientific capabilities that we have in this country of whatever kind to the war that is likely coming. And FDR, the American president said, okay. And out of that came a, a very big uh, effort during World War II from the US in terms of developing uh, most notably, and, and first big impact was radar, portable uh, mobile radar that you could put in aircraft uh, and use for hunting submarines, for example. But also, of course, most spectacularly and, and most controversially, um, and, 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 and the, the, the innovation without question changed everybody's mind about everything, uh, was the Manhattan Project, the invention of the atomic bomb. Now, so that's point number one, is that, that there was a... Um, change, a dramatic change in thinking about what is technology, how do we use technology, what technologies can threaten us through military means, but also what can we do with technology? What's the potential for technology, particularly if government is, is, is involved? And in 1945, Vannevar Bush, this is my second point, the post-war uh, application, Vannevar Bush uh, wrote a report, which is called Science, uh, the Endless Frontier, um, that pulled together lessons from that World War II experience and said, we shouldn't rely on just having useful science and a certain number of um, willing scientists available in a moment of national crisis. We should consciously develop science, both for peaceful purposes. So jobs, good, more good jobs is item number one in the Vannevar Bush 1945 agenda. Also important um, and, and, and relevant to today's discussion are better health and, and other um, applications of, you know, underpinning, let's say, modern society, consumer society, um, and as well as national, national defense. This uh, vision, Vannevar Bush's vision and the vision of the people who were around, it wasn't just a one person vision. This vision shaped the United States after 1945 and had huge influence around the world, in part because of the US role in that economy after 1945, but in part also because this um, push by the US government to invest in science, to make those scientific, that scientific knowledge available and to promote and encourage commercialization, that this had huge impact on um, the pharmaceutical industry, for example, penicillin, which was not invented by the Americans, it was invented by the British and shared with the Americans, but the Americans took it to scale. The Americans helped spread antibiotics and the availability of antibiotics around the world very, very quickly um, in the 1940s. Better health, um, big changes in, in transportation, including the development of, of jet uh, aircraft and everything, I mean, literally everything to do with the modern digital computer industry came from government push, some of which, which was deliberate with, with specific goals in mind, but, but a lot of it was also um, unintended consequences in a positive sense. We, we usually talk about unintended consequences of technology development in a negative sense. And of course, th those are important, including the effects on uh, the environment, for example, uh, which, we, which we're, we're grappling with and I'll come back to. But in terms of un unintended consequences for, of, of a positive kind for productivity, for health, uh, for human um, better human lives. Uh, the US got plenty of that from the 1940s and into the 1950s. What's really interesting about the, the rationale here is that while there was an economic motivation, it was invest in science, there are big spillover effects. Let's share those broadly across American society and then the world, although the world has always been a secondary consideration. Again, a very important point we'll come back to. There, there is, uh, at the core of this, a, a very solid, well, there was a solid sort of economic speculation that I think has been absolutely substantiated 
by subsequent experience and by evidence, which is if you put public money into research and development, basic science, certainly in, in a relatively high income country like the United States, you get big positive spillover effects and a very high social rate of return. But almost none of this push for new breakthrough technologies, almost none of it was driven in the first instance by standard profit and loss considerations. Now, of course, as technologies get commercialized, companies are involved, people raise capital, investors want to be rewarded. So I, I'm not saying that the the, the private enterprise piece was was unimportant. Obviously, the United States is is somewhat obsessed with private enterprise, as I think you know. But I, I am emphasizing that the success of the United States in creating new technologies and new industries and good jobs around those industries in that post-war period was because of a partnership between public investment in basic science. And, 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 a, and a willingness and an encouragement to commercialize the new knowledge created and private business, which, which built on, on, on that new knowledge. Now, I think the US is, is interesting for the global South for a couple of reasons. I, again, you can disagree with me on this uh, shortly, but what, one thing that, that really fascinates me about the United States, so one, one reason is obviously it becomes the, the technological leader. It drives the creation of many new things, products um, after 1945. But the other really interesting thing about the United States is if you go back to, well, I, I would start in 1820, for example. In 1820, the US was a small, relatively backward agricultural country. In 1851, when the British organized what was called the Great Exhibition, the London Exhibition, it was the first of the of what became very fashionable world fairs where countries uh, were invited and, and submitted uh, their leading products and their most fascinating innovations for everyone to look at and to admire and you know to brag about. Uh, in, 19, in 1851, in London, at the Crystal Palace Exhibition, the Americans had almost nothing on exhibition because they had almost nothing to show except some stuffed animals, which had been shot, some wild animals, and some guns. I think you can see the relationship there. And of course, the American fascination with guns is very longstanding. But that was it. There was nothing of what was about to come, which was the transformation of American manufacturing or the creation of American manufacturing, transformation of other manufacturing as well. In 18, by 1890, roughly, plus or minus 10 years, the US was the leading industrial power in the world in terms of total GDP. By 1913, the size of the American economy was twice the size of the British economy. So how did the United States go from being an agricultural backwater at the beginning of the 19th century to being one of the leading industrial powerhouses with a lot of shared prosperity, of course, it's not perfect. The US has always had a lot of inequality, more inequality than, than similar countries, pretty much every stage of, of, of the way. But that was a profound and real and long lasting industrial transformation. And that was the basis of a great deal of success in the, in the 20th century. And, and the, the answer is, of course, that the, the Americans were short of skilled labor in the 19th century and were forced to find ways to innovate, to create manufacturing, to take advantage of the opportunities, particularly I would emphasize opportunities uh, that were really opened up by the development of railways, not a technology invented of course in the United States, but a technology that the US developed further and perfected and applied to American realities. So as the railroad opened markets, as the railroad made it easier for European immigrants to move across the Americas, as markets developed, there was a lack of skilled labor. American manufacturing was all about making relatively less skilled workers more productive. The system of interchangeable parts, for example, I think can be reasonably be interpreted as making it less necessary to have skilled artisans in your factory. This increase in productivity for low skilled workers created factories that were highly efficient in the US context, but could also be efficient and highly profitable if you took the same technology and the same organization back to Europe. 
So the Singer Sewing Machine Company, for example, that was a big deal in the 1850s in the US, also found great success in Scotland with a very similar organization of work. So the US had gone in a period of 30 to 50 years from basically having nothing to contribute to new technology, a few adaptations perhaps to US realities, but really not much, to being at the forefront of innovation and being able to create through investing and building factories, more good jobs back in Europe, raising the demand for relatively unskilled labor. And that was a big part of changing European manufacturing, pushing up wages in ways that were consistent with the, the new trade union movement, for example. And that was a major mechanism we talk about in, a, in our book, Power and Progress, for wages rising. So in, in this story that I just told you, um, the U.S. has risen through, rose through technology investment, rose through private initiative, responding to those incentives, responding to the price of labor and relatively expensive and unavailable skilled labor in the United States. 1940, to come back to my first point, is a major transformation because prior to 1940, very few people in the private sector wanted the government to be involved in research and development. And actually most scientists in the 1930s, uh, to the extent we, we can look at their letters and opinion polls from that time, most scientists were opposed to government funding. They didn't want government grants, might come as a surprise to you, but they thought that there were too many strings attached. They thought the government should be doing other things. This all changed in the 1940s. And now you had a model in which private enterprise is creating jobs, making less skilled people more productive, and the government is subsidizing and funding the creation of new knowledge. Now, why, why is this a relevant consideration? Why, why should I spend time on, on this history today? Well, let me tell you that the uh, last meetings I had in 1920, sorry, in 2020, before the US economy shut down because of the arrival of COVID, the last meetings I had were talking to various people in the US government on Capitol Hill in Congress about why the US should spend more money on science, why we should double down, why we had um, forgotten, I would say, over the past 40 years, the beneficial effects of this government investment. It hadn't, it didn't shrink to zero, but it, it's less than half of what it was as a percent of GDP at its peak in the 1960s. What, what happened in COVID, of course, I, from a US perspective, I'm telling you the story, and a US technology perspective, is that we used accumulated scientific expertise, particularly in the invention of vaccines, particularly the mRNA vaccines that were based on new science, science that had was not particularly targeted uh, at uh, vaccines, certainly not vaccines against infectious disease of, of the SARS-CoV-2 variety. This was a 1940 type moment. 1940 was all about using the stock of accumulated scientific expertise and scientists to apply to a new problem, which was the rise of Germany and, and Germany, German military prowess and German military technology. The, 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 the enemy in 2020 was a virus. Um, it, but the same logic applied. What are we going to do? This is an overwhelming problem. How do we um, restart our economy? How do we save? How do we save lives? And the good news from, from that, I would say, um, and this is the major good news part of what I'm going to say, is that this lesson has largely been learned by people across the political spectrum in the United States. Now, th the way these issues are framed in American politics is not always ideal. And this is, I am absolutely emphasizing, this is throughout what I'm saying today, it is driven 99% by American considerations about America, right? These are parochial incentives which is part of the reason we, we've got some caveats coming in a few moments. But in, in um, last year, US Congress passed what's called the Chips and Science Act, which was a big uh, further investment in basic science and expansion of that, as well as a particular set of um, incentives and, and financial support for the semiconductor chip industry. I understand that some of this is driven by American perceptions of rivalry, rivalry with China. We can talk about whether or not that's uh, constructive. I think up to a point, it's fine. 
but you do need to be careful. Um, there was also there has also been a a, a a continuation and a doubling down of investment in renewable energy technology, including solar and wind, which is absolutely a positive for us. And I would suggest for the world to the extent this technology becomes cheaper around the world. I was in a discussion just last night uh, with people working on issues related to the Texas power grid. Texas obviously produces a lot of oil, but they also have very strong solar and wind um, assets. And they're working hard to build up their storage capacity for the at least at the grid level, because that's a major uh, weakness that they have. This is entirely driven by Texas and by trying to make power supply cheaper and more reliable in Texas, right? But it does generate technology that can be made available to the world. And I think health is another perfect example where <laughs> the US health system has its problems and we arguably overpay for some things, including some of the drugs that we use, but that does create an incentive to innovate. It does create a, a, a very big market for pharmaceutical companies and with the right incentives and with the right regulation, they can share that technology at much lower cost with the rest of the world. Now, I understand that doesn't always happen. I understand that access to vaccines was not equitable. I understand that these parochial American incentives don't always help the rest of the world. I think that's something that, that we should talk about. But we to, to address the, the question as, as, as posed by, by Imran a moment ago, can we change the direction of technological change? Absolutely. Have we done it repeatedly? Yes. Has it had massive positive consequences for a lot of people? Yes. Are there unintended consequences? Of course, you always have to watch out for unintended consequences and you have to be careful, particularly when you're creating things that have a lot of destructive power or that can be used in, in destructive ways. But I think that the main problem with um, the, the, the type of innovation that's driven by the United States and, and other rich countries, uh, of course, in, including in, in, in Europe and Japan, the main problem is um, access to that technology uh, equitable sharing, particularly on on, on, the, on the side of things that would give you a better health and also help um, improve your environment and, and address global climate change. So that's the good news. Here's the here's the the more the more complicated news, which is about what the private sector is doing right now. So the obviously the the uh, innovation on on the top of everybody's uh, mind at the moment in, in the US, and I think probably around the world, but you can correct me uh, if you have a different perspective, is artificial intelligence. Now, this push for artificial intelligence or AI is not particularly driven by, by the government in the United States. Yes, it, it is been made available by a digital transformation that comes out of earlier US investments in digital computers, and of course, in the um, backbone or the, or the the beginnings of the, of the internet. But what has driven AI over the past 20 years and, and what's led to the big changes over the past three years is almost all private capital, private enterprise. Now, that's not necessarily a problem, although I would flag, and, and this is our concern for the United States, that a lot of this private emphasis, the vision, if you like, and this is the point also of, of my book with Ron Asimoglu, I think you always have to ask, Who's driving the technology? Who's doing the inventing? And what is their vision? So Vannevar Bush and his colleagues in 1945 had a vision for technology, a vision that I would argue was largely realized and mostly, I think, in, in retrospect, we can say positive. What is the vision of the companies driving the AI transformation today? It's largely what's called machine intelligence, which you can translate as attempting to replicate hum what humans can do and largely replace humans. Now, th there is another approach, another tradition in computer science, another element of uh, potential technology development that we call machine usefulness, in which you could focus development of computers on helping individuals become more productive as opposed to replacing individuals. That's an interesting debate. It's a debate that we have with our colleagues at MIT, with people in the computer science industry or the tech industry. I can't say I'm afraid that we're winning that debate. AI is being driven by two big companies and, and their friends, 
Google and Microsoft, they are very focused on replacing people. And, and they have got a lot of money and a lot of expertise um, in, invested in that. Now, to be very clear, we, this is Jerome S. Smogler and I, are not opposed to automation. If you review any reasonable history of the past 250 years, or if you go back a thousand years, which is what we do in our book, you'll see that, that all, all the breakthroughs in productivity worth mentioning are about automation, right? So if we think about the water wheel, if we think about the steam engine, if we think about railways, if we think about the assembly line, if we think about bringing electricity to the assembly line, these were all big changes in the productivity of labor or the marginal productivity of labor, how much a, an additional worker could produce. And that with, with enough pressure uh, and competition for workers are pushing up the demand for labor, that is what gives you higher wages and more broadly shared prosperity. But there's a key element in what I just said, which is in addition to automating away the previous work or the previous tasks, you need to be creating new tasks at the same time. So Henry Ford brought the car production, automobile production to the assembly line, and he brought electricity to that assembly line. These were huge innovations. He increased the productivity of labor by about a hundred times. When he started, the US was making 20,000 cars a year, handmade, skilled labor. That was in 1900. By the end of the 1920s, the US was making between one and two million cars a year and employing 400,000 people in this industry. Most of those people were doing things that nobody had ever done before 1900 or ever in human history. So when you're evaluating these technologies, when saying, okay, what are we getting from this on the job side? We argue that you need to look at how much you're replacing in terms of people, what's the automation, straightforward automation component, and and what is the um, what are the new tasks that are being created? Now it's also true that if you have a big enough boost of productivity from automation, the pure automation, you can get some positive benefits. You can get much cheaper goods, for example. However, we worry, and 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 there's some evidence to support this, that a lot of current automation, including uh, the way that computers are being used, produces what um, my colleague Duran and Pascal. Restrepo called so-so automation. So what's so-so automation? Well, the self-checkout kiosk in a grocery store or supermarket is a good example. Those self-checkout kiosks transfer work from people who used to, who were checking out the checkout clerks to the customers. The customers may struggle to do the work, um, but they don't get paid to do it. The productivity of people in those stores generally doesn't go up. They don't get higher wages. Some of them get fired. You change the balance of power between management and labor but you're not having a big productivity transformation. So it doesn't have to be this way. We, the, our book is full of ideas about how to get um, more productivity, more human creativity, support um, people rather than replacing people with artificial intelligence. It's a fascinating debate. It's an ongoing debate. It's a debate that's being will be reflected to some degree in legislation, I think that will develop in the US later this year, next year. But look, it's very, very hard to, to legislate around innovation and it's super hard to regulate in innovation effectively. But then I think th th it leads to this question and this concern that, that I'd like to share with you today. And, and I'll end on this, which is, all right, if the US and other countries are inventing things for their own purposes, and those are driven by the price of labor um, in those countries, and, and there's a government element, there's a private sector element, and I, you know, Duran and I are trying to tilt that in, in the way of being more pro-people, pro-human, and to create more good jobs in the United States. But what's the impact on the rest of the world? So if we have artificial intelligence, for example, in the form of chat GPT, again, I'm fascinated to hear your questions and, and your statements on this and your experience, but we worry that because chat GPT is a universally available technology that's, I think, spread around the world within days, if not hours, of, of being launched, that what you have here is an example of what people used to call um, inappropriate technology, meaning inappropriate relative to, to wages um, in lower income countries. So if you're using a technology that's 
relevant and, and compelling and invented in a high wage country, but it becomes available immediately in a lower wage country, what's the impact on jobs in the lower wage country? Now, again, if it creates new tasks, if it changes the global division of labor, or if it creates better opportunities, new things to do within your own economy in India, in other lower income countries, then I think we should feel good about it. But if it's replacing people, if it's eroding maybe even better paid jobs and not creating sufficient new tasks, not boosting the demand for labor, then I think we have a problem or a, more accurately, a continuation of a previous problem. What if, uh, for example, AI makes it easier to automate factories and makes it the U.S more inclined to bring production back to the US or higher income countries will keep those factories. What will the lower income workers do um, in countries that are trying to develop? You know, if, if we can find a win-win here, if this new technology boosts productivity, lowers the costs of goods, and there are some gains in terms of buying the technology, I think renewables is a good example. We can feel good about that. I think if we can share the benefits of health innovations, cheaply, because frankly, the pharmaceutical companies make enough money selling to the US and a few other countries. I think that's a positive. But in terms of artificial intelligence, in terms of replacing people at work, I think we have grave concerns. We, we have grave concerns about the United States and the impact in high wage countries. We're quite worried that the direction of technology will increase inequality. But what's going to be the impact on low wage countries on less skilled workers in those lower wage countries or on the middle class in, in those lower wage countries? I think that's a big question mark right now. We don't have the evidence and the data, but it is definitely something to worry about. And if we are worried about it, then going back up the chain of my reasoning, is there a redirection of technological progress that would help the global self right now? Either something that we should do for its own sake or to counteract this big private sector push into artificial intelligence. I think there is an agenda for the developed countries. I think we know what we need to do. I think we know, well, we, we have proposals and, and, and they're getting traction about where to spend the money on what and so on. But for middle income and lower income countries, I think it's not yet clear. And, and I welcome all suggestions and, and ideas and, and further consideration and debate around this topic. So with that, thank you very much. Let me conclude my remarks and um, I'm happy to answer questions and enter into any discussion that you would have. Great, Simon, thank you so much. So I'm going to immediately then open it up uh, for any thoughts or questions anyone might have. I think to keep things easy since we, we, we kind of doing this online, I'm going to take one question at a time, and I'm, I'm going to try to go from the room to people online. So there's a, a large audience online, uh, um, a large um, a large audience that's online as well. Uh, so let's start with uh, let's start with Santosh. Was Johnson, that was a masterly presentation of a, of a very long history. My question is about the United States and a statement you made about the United States uh, becoming the lead industrial power by the last quarter of the 19th century, while by the 1850s, till the 1850s, it was pretty much an agricultural country. Now, it's interesting that you, you time this uh, American transformation uh, with somewhere sort of coterminously with when the second industrial revolution is happening. And it's also happening after the civil war is over, the American civil war is over. Now, what, what, I, what I know about, you know, Professor Peter Lindert's work, uh, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, uh, Peter actually says that uh, it's Northeast United States which is where education was most advanced and which is where I presume, I mean, I might not be fully understanding the geography of that second industrial revolution that's, that's lead, being led by the Northeast, 
it's the Northeast, which is actually much better educated. So they were in a sense ready uh, in a way that perhaps the South of the United States was not for reasons I think, which I'm sure we all know. So would you agree with this characterization uh, of the role of the educational development in the Northeast sort of preceding that industrial transformation? Because this is, has implications and I'm finishing this, but this is real implications for a country like India which is trying to undergo many transformations simultaneously. And uh, we're not quite making the investments in, in our human capital as we could have or should have. So. Right. Over to you, Simon. Right, great, great, great question. Yes, so uh, obviously there was a big difference between the Northern part of the United States and the Southern part of the United States, where the number one um, item that I would emphasize was slavery. And the the problems of slavery were, yes, partly in terms of average level of education, but I think much more generally in terms of the oppression of people, um, both in the obviously during the slave plantation era, but also in reconstruction after the Civil War. So the, the South does have some technological change, actually. Uh, there's a really, it's a really horrible story that um, Eli Whitney, among other people, invented a cotton gin that from the 1790s made it possible to develop uh, a, a much bigger plantation cotton um, uh, economy across the deep south. That was not possible um, before they improved the cotton gin, which is a way of processing the cotton um, that, that grew in those areas. So American technology has always had two sides, you could say. what One part motivated by wanting to use slaves more effectively, that's what took hold in the South. Another part that was based on, on free labor was in the North. You're, you're right that education is, is, a, is a variable there, but remember education levels for everyone were quite low in, in the 19th century. Very few of these people in the North, for example, completed high school. And the, the big change I would say that happened a little before the Civil War, but you're quite right, it's, it's during and after the Civil War. It's mostly about moving westwards. It's mostly about building railroads, opening markets. So it's the connection from the mid-Atlantic, northeast, across to the west, into what we now call the Midwest. Um, and the development of Chicago, uh, for example, which was absolutely uh, astonishingly fast and, and also involved um, mechanization of agriculture. This comes more after the 1870s. So people would leave farms in the Midwest, go to work in Chicago making reapers, um, corn reapers, harvesting equipment for McCormick, a big company there. Um, and, and those reapers would then be sold to the farms and those people would then be displaced or come to work from the farms into the city. So that dynamic was a normal dynamic, yes. Education was an important part of it, absolutely. And the um, identified locally driven uh, initiative at that time was to increase education. So the so-called high school movement was an important part of it. In, the, in, the, in that Northern area, the South struggled I would suggest still struggles to escape the, this awful legacy um, of of slavery. So I I'm obviously very uh, much in favor of more education. I don't think that education by itself delivers economic um, development, but it, it certainly is complementary to other efforts and, and and should be encouraged whenever possible. Okay, let's uh, take the question at the back then. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, Jamie Woodcock, University of Essex. Um, I, I, well, I enjoyed your presentation. I mean, I had some disagreements with some of the stuff around pharmaceuticals, but the question that I wanted to ask really was about the risk of seeing technology purely in terms of productivity or efficiency, because there's a long history of technologies granting greater control, and indeed control being one of the things that employers choose to go for with technology rather than just efficiency. Noble's work in forces of production, for example, I think is, 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 is quite illustrative of this. And if the chair will allow, I just want to give a very short anecdote that I'd be interested to know your thoughts on. I was recently commissioned to write a report on the future of work, uh, and I gave them the union rates for writing this report. And they said, well, we don't have the money for the union rates. I said, all right, well, what, what, you know, what money do you have? 
And they said, we have enough for you to edit a chat GPT report and put your name on it. <laughs> now, I think this is quite illustrative in a way because you can't just resell something that chat GPT produces because anybody can produce that report. But you can try and cheapen academic labor by making us put our name to things that we haven't written. And so it seems to me that if we want to know what the future of work looks like, you're right, we need to focus on the interests involved in making that technology, but also how it's used within workplaces. If it's going to be used for greater control, the kind of future of work we're likely to get is going to be worse and worse, probably. All right, Simon? Yes, great, great point about control over work. So, Jamie, send me your address. I'm happy to send you a copy of Power and Progress because we have a lot of material about um, the, the, the long history of, of uh, stripping autonomy from workers in, in the factory system and, and then how uh, the workers managed to eventually, but it took a long time and it was a really long struggle, get some shared prosperity after that. I mean, it's, it's a 100, 150 year struggle, right? Um, and, and Noble's Force of Production is one of my favorite sources. It's slightly out of my reach over here on the bookshelf, so I don't want to leave the screen, but otherwise I'd pull it out and, and prove that to you. Um, on on ChatGPT, I, I think this is exactly what we're worried about, right? That, that the, and, and this is, of course, what the Writers Guild of America is on strike about, in part, with good reason, which is they, they fear that creative writing of all kinds will become debased, displaced by... ChatGPT and, 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 and other similar large language models. And I think they're absolutely right. I think that is completely spot on. So the question is, you know, what, what uh, agreement can they negotiate? And then to what extent can we learn from that? And to what extent can it benefit other people who don't have, who don't have a union? Um, but I, I think that um, the challenge from AI, the challenge of that AI will primarily displace people including creative people including academic careful researchers i think that's a big problem in addition of course chat gpt is not to be relied upon uh, for accuracy and, and i think has got many other problems that are being glossed over by the corporate sector in in the pursuit of of some cheap um well in pursuit of profit and some cheap gains so i'm going to shift to a uh a, a, a kind of question that we have online, so I mean, I don't unfortunately have the the name of the the person who asked it, mm -hmm. but the question is uh, uh, the the kind of question is this: one of the key problems uh, uh, currently is the is the uh, 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 pace of innovation, uh, making it extremely difficult for science, for um, ma making it extremely uh, difficult for societies to keep up and to 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 kind of try to impact on on that change. Do you have any ideas on how it might be possible to regulate the pace of change? Well, I think that that's a really good question, Imran, that, that I get a lot, actually, uh, been presenting this book to different kinds of audiences in different parts of the world. And honestly, I mean, I think we could, there could we, we could engage in some wishful thinking. But I have to tell you that whenever um, this topic comes up in Washington, D.C., and, and I do think U.S. policy is the, the key to this, someone um, in the back of the room, this is a metaphor, but you'll get the picture, someone in the back of the room says, China. Right. And the American policymakers are really concerned that China will overtake them, has overtaken them, could overtake them with regard to various technologies, including AI. And, and the Chinese talk about wanting to do this and the Chinese put a lot of money into it. I think that fear is overblown, honestly, but you are not going to get. And I do think the U.S. will regulate some elements of AI. Uh, particularly as it impacts privacy, particularly as it impacts surveillance. Um, but I don't think they will slow down innovation at all. So this is what I meant by the, the private piece of this is, is a bit of a juggernaut that you that you can't stop. And you maybe you could change its course a little bit, but it's quite hard. We do have we do know how to make public investments. We do know how to accelerate progress or innovation in some things, and maybe we should do more of that, 
I think we should, things like health and share the benefits. But but the the power and the force of this private um, innovation, including when things get very fashionable, including when things, people think there's big money to be made, that is a big part of the American dynamic. And that does absolutely impact the world, including referring back to, to Jamie's question, chat GPT, you know, comes out of a American computer science and American tech industry, and it impacts everyone everywhere or all, all at once. And I think that the pace of this change is is a problem for everyone. I, I, I think at all income levels, societies are really going to struggle to grapple with the employment consequences and maybe the other consequences also in terms of social control and and, and what people are are driven to do or influenced to do if we want to talk about how you use AI and social media, for example. Yes, so I'm going to try to 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 kind of move us to closure. There's this uh, we it's it's kind of half the state. We still have to have supper. There's people who have to serve us and go home. I'm going to allow the three questions in the room. Uh, can Simon? Can I request that you, you write them down and that you respond to all three in one go? So let's let's start with Uma, uh, KP there, and then you have the last word here. Uh, can I? Can Uma first. Uma? Okay. No, no, take the lead. I have a lot of chances to speak. <laughs> this is very jumping the queue. <laughs> but anyway, since I've been given the floor, uh, you know, we were talking, Professor Jones, first of all, thanks very much. That was a fascinating talk that you gave us. Uh, Imran introduced you by asking about this issue of agency and what we can do. And you said, yes, you can actually, you know, make a difference to the way technology goes and so on. Uh, but I have a slightly, you know, a different kind of thought that it's very interesting that Mark Zuckerberg, who is leading one of the two companies leading this whole affair, which is to actually displace, uh, remove uh, workers, has been talking quite actively about the importance of uh, universal basic income. It seems to me he is looking at a world where work, human work, becomes obsolete. And but of course, if human work becomes obsolete and people don't have jobs and incomes, then there's no market. So he is in a very strange way coming back to what of all people Karl Marx used to talk about, that is, you know, uh, people being able to live uh, according to their needs rather than, you know, according to their ability and so on. Uh, it's very interesting that we've gone a full circle on this, but he has realized that there's the internal contradictions of capitalism uh, going the way they are pushing it. So I'd like to know thoughts on this. Right, let's go to Uma since she's right there. Not uh, allowing me to indulge him, Brian. Thanks a lot, Professor Johnson, for your talk. I want to get back to the chat GPT again. I think there's too much fear is being created with chat GPT. It's basically an augmentation tool. You feed into it and you get a response if you're looking for something. And I think the biggest problem there is if you're asked, trying to write an essay, it's going to basically come out with a whole lot of text without you know proper quotations or anything and you think wow it's a fantastic one and you might take it but it might be all plagiarism i think one needs to understand that you know all that you're talking about chat gpt especially with the software technology there was something called as github and github used to have whole lots of stacks with all the computer codes that were there, where any coder or programmer could go and take the basic stack and then build upon it. And now what has happened with chat GPT is basically you're, uh, you're feeding into the chat GPT all this information. So that doesn't reduce a programmer from developing further innovations, unless and until you innovate and feed in, it won't progress. So I think we have to be very careful how we are using. I would have loved to hear a lot more around AI for control and surveillance. And I think that's where a lot of headway is happening. That's where the problems are. And I think it would be great to hear a bit more around that subject. Thanks. Over to you, KP. Uh, <clears throat> my name is KP Kannan. I'm a development economist. Thank you, Professor Johnson, for this very 
interesting keynote uh, lecture. Let me straight away, I'm reading your book now halfway through. Uh, how do we redirect technology for human progress? Who is this we? Nations? Is it United Nations? When the COVID pandemic uh, was there and the, the WHO tried their best to have the COVAX program for distributing the vaccines uh, that are being produced, invented and produced. But you know very well that uh, the America and the Europeans hoarded four times or five times the requirement, their own requirement. So there's a question of you produce something which is for the global good, but you don't have access to it. The second question is about countries like India, and I'm sure in very many other countries in Africa, Latin America, uh, still agricultural, um, or look and say low income economies. And there's a lot to be done, not just in the climate change, but related to the whole environmental sustainability that has to do with their livelihoods. One of my colleagues here mentioned about why can't these high powered, high tech people work on irrigation? Water control, give them, because in a country like India, which can of course send its own rockets to the moon, but you know, we still have, uh, we don't have even 50% of our cultivated land under irrigation. So there's a lot more work to be done for uh, ecological regeneration that could also be a global good, but who will finance it? Who will lead it? The United Nations have been told uh, time and again that you are no good, and we are. And the powerful countries would say, "We don't want to uh, work with you. We will go by rule of law, our own rule of law." All right, Simon. Uh, the, the last question uh, coming from over there. Could we get the mic here, please? <laughs> Thank you, Professor Johnson. Uh, my question is short. You mentioned some win-win uh, situation. Ah, by the way, I am Gonzag from Babesh Boria University in Romania. Uh, my question is about win-win situation. Uh, you mentioned something in win-win situation. Considering the USA context, do you see or believe uh, a win-win situation with the future of work? Uh, what, what do you think about it? Is it possible with this neoliberal uh, neoliberal policy we have? What do you, what you, what can you advise on this? A win-win situation. We have seen that it's almost impossible. Um, so thank you. All right, thank you, everyone, and and I I kind of have to apologize about about closing the questions, but I I kind of do think we need to to move towards closure. Uh, back to you, Simon. I'd hoped you'd, you'd have three questions to close. By my last count, there were about 10. So I'll <laughs> pass it on to you. Well, wow, these are fantastic questions. And I'm sorry we don't have more time to discuss all this. It's super important, I think. Let me take uh, first the, the third question about who is the we. I think that is the key to the whole thing. So as I said, in, in, in at least in my version, our version of the history, the, the we is focused on, centered on people in richer countries, not all people, by the way. Um, and I think there's a tussle uh, continually between the people in those countries and, and the so-called techno elites. Um, Mark Zuckerberg is a good example of the techno elites. I mean, honestly, I think universal basic income is, is a trap. Uh, I, I understand it's put forward by, by very honorable people with very honorable intentions who are really worried about people's incomes. But if you create in the United States two classes of people, one of whom have jobs, another one don't have jobs, but they get universal basic income, I can tell you what's going to happen over time and not even a lot of time to the real value of your universal basic income. Right? It is not going to keep up with wages. It's not going to keep up with prices. Those people are going to lose out politically. So I, I think that universal basic income... Um, I understand the cuteness of the, the, or the amusing uh, parallel with, with Marx, and, and I'm sure that's what, you know, the people putting this forward are very sophisticated propagandists. But I, I think that, uh, to be completely frank with you, um, it is a cover 
that allows them to say, well, it doesn't matter if we're destroying all these jobs because you can have a universe basic income because productivity is so high. Where's the productivity gate? Where's the productivity miracle from so-so automation and from replacing people in this fashion? It's not there. Where's the productivity gate from the massive distortion of social media, which is the hallmark, hallmark of the Facebook meta era and, and the way in which they fed um, anxiety and anger and, and ethnic hatred around the world. Now, I mean, we could spend a session on that one, Imran. So look, I, I think that the we is the key issue. If you wait for the United States, you're going to wait for a long time. If you wait for the United Nations, you're going to wait even longer. So I think we ha you have to look at um, other mechanisms and you have to look at what can be afforded, what can be paid for. Sure, if, if you can get the rich countries to pay for more, I'm all in favor and I support that and I'm happy to help. But, you know, let's be realistic. OK, I think the future of technology is far too important to leave in, 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 in the hands of the, of the people, the techno visionaries. And that's my answer to the fourth question, too, which is, is there a better work, uh, vision? Can we imagine between us today a better vision for the future work? Absolutely. Of course. Could we have a division of labor of, across the, the world that would be, you know, a large element of win win? Yes. I mean, I wouldn't want to exaggerate that we couldn't find some conflicts there, but I, I, I honestly think. The problem is the vision. The problem is leaving it with these techno billionaires. You're going to get their version of what they think you want. And it's not going to include improvements for irrigation in India, right? As, as, as the fourth question, fourth question said, absolutely right. If you want, you know, this, this is the Van Eva Bush insight. This is what the US did um, during and after World War II. If you've got a problem, and you don't apply resources to it, and you don't make it your priority, and you don't say, we must fix this problem, you're not going to fix the problem, right? Um, and, and with technology, you can fix a lot of these problems. On, on the chat GPT uh, discussion, well, we, we have a lot more about this in the book, Uma, and I'm happy to send you a copy too if you don't have one. Um, I think you are absolutely right that control and surveillance are a big part of what's going to happen. I think that's what... This book will not be sold, not legally, in mainland China. And that's because we've been approached by a number of Chinese publishers who said they would love to publish it, but here are the small changes we would need to make to comply with the censor. And that would be about half the book. Right. So we're not going to do that. Um, and and I, I think the world, Imran, will fall into two camps. And, you know, India always doesn't like this. I understand that you you're going to have to make up your mind on this one. On one camp will be will be countries that use um, AI for intense social surveillance and, and control. And that will we could call that camp the China camp, if you like. Another camp will be um, a U.S. and some other countries camps where they'll put a lot of con constraints on surveillance. I think we'll have more surveillance, by the way, including in the workplace. But hopefully there'll be a lot of safeguards uh, on that and it won't be used for social oppression. To what extent should those camps, should, should, the, should the surveillance with controls camp buy goods from the high surveillance countries when they're using that surveillance to press down their workers in ways that we regard as unacceptable in our own country? I think that's going to be a fascinating public policy discussion in the US. And I think you, you, know, you may be bystanders in that. You may be more than bystanders. You have to make up, make up your, your own mind. I, I do think, uh, Omar, that there are going to be big changes in who does what within programming. Um, this is something, and I don't think we know yet whether the advantage goes more to the young people who can now accelerate their knowledge or to the more established people who don't need the young people because they can do the basic tasks using uh, some version of ChatGPT. Um, it, 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 the, the pace of change in this industry, in this technology is remarkable. It is surprising. It has surprised uh, even the, the best experts that, that, that we know. We know some pretty good experts. And I, I'm not saying we should give up. I'm not saying we should be despondent. I'm not saying there's any reason for despair. I do think we should be having more of these discussions in Iran, like we're having now about what do you want to achieve? What's the problem to be solved? What, does, what do humans really need from technology? And how do we get that rather than Mark Zuckerberg and whatever cover story he's peddling today? Thank you very much. Great. Let me with that then uh... Kind of bring, kind of bring the proceedings to uh, uh, kind of for today to the end. Let me thank, uh, kind of in. Uh, let me thank in particular Professor Johnson for uh, what, what I thought was a really uh, uh, kind of provocative and 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 kind of honest and uh, th uh, th uh, thoughtful assessment of the potential impact of of of. Uh, 
kind of of technology. So and and thank you to everyone who's who's been here. Thank you to those who've uh, kind of jo uh, joined us online, and uh, kind of apologies for all of the uh, the uh, 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 kind of technology problems that we had. But I think if you were going to have a, 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 a conference on on tech, then you were sure to have technology problems. And I think that it was particularly apt that we had it. So thank you so much, Simon, for um, um, making the time to join us today. And with that, I'll pass it back on to Priyanka. Thank you so much. Professor Johnson for this very engaging, very enriching lecture. Thank you, Professor Valodia. Thank you, Professor Ravi Shavastav, and all of you sitting here and all the people who joined online. We sincerely apologize for the technical glitch. I know it. we are delayed, but I can assure you the dinner is served outside and we have drinks too. See you again tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Thank you so much. <laughs>